That sounds right. I pressed the thing, so it should be recording. Assuming it worked. Um, hi, oh. uh, this is IPFS Implementer Sync for 17th of August, I think, 2023. Uh, smaller crew this week. Uh, there are a bunch of people taking uh, well-deserved vacations. Uh, also holidays in some countries. Uh, so, uh, so far it's just us three, but uh, we have Arguably, some Adin shouldn't be here. <laughs> yes, like we got like two <laughs> two people and Adin trying to not call, but okay. Um, uh, agenda for this meeting, uh, the usual IP corner and then on uh, time, uh, which is a surprise, I guess. <laughs> So I, I'll go over IP corner very, fairly, fairly quickly. Um, there's like one, oh gosh. I, I guess I guess there's briefly an implementations thing, right? I think oh, yes. IPIP yes. 412 support uh, in Kubo 022, which is released now. Um, so you can you can now ask for your car requests with, with duplicates in the order that you want. And then use that for low memory, uh, low memory processing of uh, increment of verifiable responses, um, which we've taken advantage of in things like Bifrost Gateway. Um, yep. yep. Know, initial implementations the have like the traffic have you know large amounts of traffic running through a single node and going from like you know tens of gigabytes of RAM and caching to like, you know, a hundred meg, you know, hundred megs or a few hundred megs um, for processing, you know, lar large amounts of traffic from many users. Yep. So effectively, those two parameters you can now pass them while requesting a car. It's opt in. Um, and over time, more and more gateways will support it. Yes. All right, uh, IPIP corner. Um, we have one thing that's ready for ratification reviews. So it's if there are no concerns with the next two weeks, we most likely will ratify this. I don't think it's co controversial. We had the conversations asynchronously and in person during IPFS thing, and I think IPFS camp. It's been a long time. Uh, do the cleanup of IPNS spec. Um, The PR is here. You can preview it here, I believe. And the gist is that we now clarified um, in the IPNS record specification. Oh uh, gosh, not this one, this one. We've clarified how um, oh, this is not on the PR. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, this one is on the pull request. Yes. Yeah. So what the gist of the spec, if you are not patient, is the change in record creation and record verification section. I think the gist is that now we the specification default to only produce the V2 signatures without duplicating data. But if you need backward compatibility, there's a separate section which describes how to create backward compatible record. Uh, the record verification it has a single version and it covers both. So historically, we've, like, we already ignore sign those legacy signatures in new implementations, uh, but this record verification just makes sure that if there is an old signature, the, the old fields and the new fields should be in sync. So people don't get too creative with creating correct V2, but they perform an attack on V1. Um, in such case, that record, even we don't care about V1, we care about values being in sync. Uh, more details and you know the usual motivation is on the IP, but um, I believe that's the gist. Um, 
And other two that we are looking for feedback, or maybe like if I didn't know Alan have questions on the IPNS one before I move forward. I think we are in sync. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, um, yep. So if uh, someone missed this meeting, there's still time. Uh, but also we don't make any breaking changes. Maybe that that's something I failed to mention is that what Kubo does by default remains uh, this. So Kubo by default creates backward compatible records. Um, it's mostly a cleanup of the specification that if someone runs a control environment where they have both client and server uh, using modern records, they don't need to pay uh, the performance hit of duplicating all the values. Uh, instead, they can just create the, the lean record. But Kubo and JS IPNS in Helia, uh, by default, they will keep producing those hybrid records and the validation will be updated. So it keeps uh, V1 in check with V2, but only V2 signatures are being uh, used. That's been the case for over a year. I think we are reaching two years of this behavior. So it's not, effectively, it's not a ch any change to what's already happening, but we are creating a possibility of the future where we only create those lean records or new implementations may decide to only implement the lean records. Um, and, yeah. and a reminder that the old records are just like bad, as in like the signature is 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 like no good, um, which is why this, the new records exist. So like if you're using the old records, stop. Yeah, um, yeah. The, the reason we, effectively the only reason you would create this hybrid thing is when you have a legacy clients and you want to upgrade them and you use IPNS as a mechanism for upgrading your software. Um, so um, probably that's the only same uh, reason to use V1 in 2023. Um, okay, and two additional ones, uh, I'll quickly mention them. One is about adding uh, I met some metadata to a car responses. Um, and it's still in a draft stage and we are still trying to figure out um, the scope and needs. But the gist of this IPIP is that um, some project, projects, for example, Saturn and Project RIA um, have a need for passing some additional um, metadata with car responses. That could be used for uh, content integrity figuring out if the car stream was truncated or um, some additional uh, metadata related to paying for the retrieval or attesting that the retrieval actually happened and not was uh, piggybacked or someone else. Um, those are initial use cases which were mentioned in this IPIP. Um, and there is a section about alternative approaches, uh, which I think is maybe like a good, yeah, it's here. And, you know, we cannot use HTTP trailers because the JS in a web browser is not able to access them. And we want to have a JS code running in a service worker to be able to, 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 to fetch cars and operate on them. Uh, we could create a new content type. We could focus on the creating car v3, which mm -hmm. is a next, it's it's a single thing instead of having multiple things for multiple purposes maybe we gather enough needs to uh, to work on the new version of car so this is a high level overview of both needs and why this ip was opened um the the gist of the ip is that instead of doing those things like trailers or new content type or car v3 we say that there's an opt-in signaling method uh, for saying that the last block in the car stream uh, is the manifest in that JSON format or that symbol. Um, details, TBD, uh, is it, uh, what are the downsides of this? Probably we, we will hit some hiccups in the HTTP caching unless the 
middleware that's doing the HTTP caching is aware that, hey, this is a special thing at the end of a card that you should just ignore. Otherwise, we would be caching um, things uh, which are not related to data. We'll be mixing control plane with transport plane. Um, yeah, I uh, I feel this is like a big, uh, the, it, this touches uh, on a bigger set of problems in our ecosystem. So for example, if we have this metadata, in theory, we could we, we could have like a mechanism for detecting when the car stream was truncated. Um, we could have a mechanism for projects to pass third party data, uh, metadata, for example, um, some like retrieval, uh, economic incentives could be built on top of that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we are mixing a control plane with transport and may have uh, interop, uh, interop problems, uh, especially if a car that was created with this metadata gets cached on the HTTP layer. And, um, and then it gets returned to the client, which did not opt in, right? It could be by a misconfiguration or it could be for other reasons. But then uh, we effectively broke the clients uh, because they re retrieve an invalid car, which is valid up to the point. Um, yeah, it, it's it, it's sort of like a um, not a kind of worms, but it's uh, there's like a lot of uh, unexpected second uh, level effects that come from this, and uh, and we have some tension between. Um, trying to squeeze this metadata in within the existing car v2 uh, car v1 wire format and maintaining backward compatibility with existing clients for example being able to import that car stream as is even without dropping the additional metadata to existing clients like kubo and not getting an error um and at some point uh, we may, it, it's still an open question. Do, uh, are we able to do that? Uh, and are we able to get all the benefits that were described on this IPIP? Or should we instead focus on doing the car v3? I don't know if I made, uh, if if I painted the, the, the landscape well enough, but it's a, a lot of uh, loose ends. And this, we are trying to like tie them together here, but I'm not sure if we'll be able to do so. Um, I don't know this, the the the, uh, the exact scope of this, but like, would would it be possible for the car metadata to change depending on like who you fetch it from? Yeah. Yeah. So, so then that... you'd have to make sure your e tags are good still. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's it impacts HTTP caching significantly, and you know if it if you use this for passing metadata about who retrieved the data, mm -hmm. and you pay that person, um, then do you st pay them because it was placed in the cache for every like retrieval that was fetched from the cache? It, it, it's yeah. you know it's tricky space. There's also like sort of unrelated things, which is there's pressure being put on the car spec in other places like to support large blocks incrementally verifiably which is not this this does nothing for right and so like if if people are going to push on that anyway then it might be worth considering like you know where does this where where does making this change go in to the existing format if you're going to if if a new format is going to have to come around soon, anyhow. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So and, if you are interested yeah. in cars, if you are interested in cars and such, and and have opinions on like how Love cars. how this might work, then then probably there are th this 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 IPIP and some other ones are ones that you should keep your eyes open for mm -hmm. uh, over the coming you know months. Yeah, there is a, you know, I, I think the the first question we'll have to answer on this IPIP is what do we exactly want? And anything that, that goes beyond just adding regular block 
effectively forces our hand to do this, which is we need separate content type because it's no longer a car. There's no spec for this new thing anywhere. Um, and may, that may be, that's like an, an answer, but then let's say fast forward to like a year or two and we have car v3, like, do we, like we are still stuck with this thing as a legacy that we need to support, right? So yeah, feedback welcome. Um, I think it's it's a good place to, it's a good, very good to have a reference, a public reference for those discussions and, and conversation, the pros and cons, because uh, I've been talking with multiple people and uh, everyone sees a part of the bigger picture and there are always like ramifications in the places where that you don't care, right? <laughs> that are not mm -hmm. relevant to your use case. But often uh, there are like ecosystem level uh, considerations. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, the, probably, you know, car v3 will be the safest because it's like a very clear um, evolution instead of trying to squeeze new functionality into legacy things. Um, and somehow related to evolution is the next IP, which is signaling features on HTTP gateways. Um, this is like a small one. And I think I mentioned it before. Um, TLDR is that we've been adding features to gateways, for example, being able to fetch a partial cars, uh, the IP 412, uh, 42, or maybe uh, requesting an ordered car, IP 412. So, would, and projects like IPFS, uh, Chromium, uh, in Chromium and uh, mobile browser implementations, it would like to use gateways in a smarter way beyond block by block. But for that, sniffing features is not, not the best way of uh, start uh, of getting user to rendering page very fast. <laughs> so uh, this is a very small IP, which suggests that we should uh, find a way for, for gateway to signal what they support, which version of car, uh, which parts or uh, which subsets of trustless gateway spec is it just block by block or maybe if a car do you support paths uh range, range requests and other things but then the question is um which hash functions or what codex could be traversed right if i request a partial car that means i i the gateway needs to have some support for the data i'm requesting um and you would not be asking gateway for a data that it cannot process so instead of like trial and error, uh, this is a very uh, clear way of detecting features using uh, HTTP options. Um, so if anyone has option opinions about options, uh, be using options for this, uh, drop a comment there. Um, there's a bunch of other ongoing work on the IP board, but I think that's out of scope of this call. Feel free to inspect the list. We'll get to them eventually. <laughs> and I think Mar Marco that's filed it. an issue, which is a, a proto IPIF that might be our smallest one yet, if we can land it. Although I don't know, maybe it'll grow a little, which is to, to name a protocol handler for the gateway API so that it can be served uh, over libp2p as well. Um, so mm -hmm. the HTTP over libp2p spec uh, has been has been moving along um and so we have this we have this http api that seems like it'd be useful uh how could nodes serve it even if they do not have ca certs so you could serve it over a lip p2p transport uh but you got to give it a name so that we can mount it as a protocol handler uh mm -hmm. and then use the uh you know lip dot well known and 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 the things that are defined in that spec so that uh you can write the same code for downloading stuff and it can run against you know normal HTTP endpoints and HTTP endpoints you know proxied over something like web transport or quick or whatever. Yeah yeah especially web transport uh, is important because that like removes the mixed content problem or sending your data include text over internet. Uh, so, yeah, that definitely collapses complexity if we have that. Uh, is that um, uh, in uh, lib P2P specs repo? So there is a lib P there in the lib P2P specs repo. There is is the HTTP over lib P2P spec, and then in 
IPFS slash specs, I think today or yesterday, Marco filed an issue saying, hey, what should we name this thing? Should it be this? I'll file an IPIF if you tell me it's okay. Uh, um, oh, yeah, I got it. Yep, I think it's it makes sense. So we'll this is a, a very... Very small one, but uh, I'm, I'm, you know, deciding on a name here unlocks some value because then we can start uh, using this and serving data. Serving data this way is like pretty easy because you can like serve, serving bytes this way is just the gateway API. And then people can start building clients that pull in all the bytes. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, sounds good. Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, I think that's it from the IP corner and spec corner, and now it's Alan time. Should I stop screen? I really screen? didn't mean. <laughs> I really didn't mean for this. Um, but uh, before before Alan time, can um, I wanted to just? It's kind of related to uh, mm -hmm. the metadata thing, and because you mentioned about like using the metadata block as like a terminator, so you know when the stream is. Is finished um and i guess um what's well, kind of the, something that we're working on or just experimenting with is like um just retrieving cars by the cid of the car um and so you, when you get all of the car data with all of its blocks in it you know that what you asked for is what you got and then there's this other thing we're kind of experimenting with is like content claims so the idea that users who create content and can then claim information about what 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 it is they it contains so for instance if you've got like a root cid of a dag you might you might claim that it's in this particular car file with this cid so and then um so when you come to kind of request it you would look up the content claim for your dag root which would tell you it's in this car um and then uh, you can actually request that car from our gateway at, at the moment you can put a car cid in 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 like w3s.link slash ipfs slash baggy whatever it is for a car uh, and you can retrieve the whole car and that's kind of cool but you can also um then be like well can i get the content claim for that car cid and that content claim might be like that car includes this uh this index and you have like a cid for the index for that car uh, and the index would be a car v2 index and you can get that hold of that index and then you know what blocks are in that car and at what or offsets they are and then so when you make a request to our gate way you can actually just use http range requests to get regular range requests not like the the kind of um DAG API range range for blocks. You'd you'd literally just read the blocks from the car from the gateway for what you want, um, and that and that's I guess a way of doing that. Like making sure you have all of the the uh, you you don't have to read like the whole DAG. You can just read the bits you want because you know what's in that car and you know you can then traverse. Um, anyway, anywho, that's kind of aside. Um, I am here today and I hope to be here most most weeks. Um, I just thought um, I should sort of turn up because we like Dag House to also operate a um, or implement, uh, operate an implementation of IPFS that we like to call Elastic IPFS. Um, and I just thought I should give it, give you guys a, a like really quick update on uh, what's happened there quite recently um, as part of our uh, we're kind of doing a big kind of cost saving exercise. And uh, so some things have changed. I just thought I'd quickly show you um, what changed. Um, so as a recap, this is a slide from another presentation. Uh, this is kind of what happens in, in um, nft.storage and web3.storage. We have like some workers that operate in Cloudflare and we receive car uploads to both of these services. And they get put in a bucket. So there's just cars in a bucket. Um, and that's over here. And then we've got, and so that bucket can be any bucket anywhere. It doesn't matter to Elastic. It just needs to know that there's a bucket and that it can make range requests to that bucket for um, blocks. And when, when cars go into the bucket, we actually like index their contents. So we know 
like what blocks are in the car that went in and what uh, what offsets they're at, um, et cetera. And that goes into this like Dynamo DB block index thing. And um, to actually serve that data, we have a Kubernetes cluster um, of a bunch of bit swap peers. They just accept like WebSockets and they're just like node processes. We were running about like 50 nodes or something. They're pretty meaty machines that have to, that, like pretty meaty meat VMs that have to sort of run them. We get a lot of traffic, um, as you can imagine. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it turns out like, um, there we go, running, <laughs> running like 50 Kubernetes uh, pods, uh, kind of expensive on some big VMs. Um, over over time, um, as you can imagine, and um, and then there is also the problem of like uh, we actually for when people try and or people peers try and connect to uh, our bits what peers, um, they kind of go through this load balancer, which sort of distributes the load between the um, available pods in the Kubernetes cluster. Um, and in the pods, when they get asked for a CID, they go to block index, find out where that um, block is, and re and run it to the um, to ask for it that's kind of fire um yeah the this this part of just running a bunch of vms and also this load balancer and a uh like all of the egress that comes out of there which is a lot by the way um it was just very expensive so what we did um is we we switched it up uh, and we moved these bits what peers oh, hang on let me try and get a bit closer to that. It might help. Uh, okay. uh, we moved these bits of peers. Anyway, I'll just continue and hopefully you're still there. Um, we moved these bits of peers into Cloudflare. So now, they're, now they are just workers that run in Cloudflare. Um, and they they just serve uh, they they just serve the data from um from buckets uh, and they're no longer part of this Kubernetes cluster. We've moved them out of that, and we're now running them as uh, as as workers in um, in Cloudflare. And that means that there's actually a whole lot of load of like management that we don't have to do um, with like uh, Kubernetes and deploying to that with Ansible slash whatever it is that you you're using to manage your your cluster um, because. When you deploy a worker to to Cloudflare, it just sort of it runs it whenever a request comes in, and it manages the scaling for you, so you don't have to to, to do any any of that or configure any of that or watch it um, because it's just it just happens. Um, so that was that was super cool because it meant that we lost a load of like infrastructure code that we no longer have to manage. Um, and we also uh, share like egress from Cloudflare is significantly less expensive than it was um, from uh, in the Kubernetes cluster the in AWS in uh, for the for the like load balancer we don't have any costs with load balancing that's just all managed for us in Cloudflare so like all in all we switch cloud provider. Um, for this part of the infrastructure of Elastic IVFS and saved a bunch of money and it was great. Uh, so just wanted to kind of update people on what, what's going on there. Um, no other what are the, no other, what, other than that. <laughs> how, um, what would the cost be like for basically like a a bit swap request this way compared to like just an HTTP block request with the gateway API. Are they going to be sort of similar? Or... Um. Well, well, what for like a single block? Well, I like if I mean just like if you could implement, and I think we did this in in Helia. You could you could just implement, like take any any bit swap client and sort of just swap out the ask peer for block with ask ask peer for block using HTTP and like yep. the, you will get the same behavior. So the question sort of like, because, because Elastic IPFS isn't doing any want list tracking really. It's kind of just like, you asked me for stuff, let me tell you if I have it. And I think it does blocking cues to like handle all of that. Mm -hmm. So would it be like, does it make him 
any sort of meaningful difference to do a block request over HTTP versus the block request over BitSwap to the over over HTTP. Like if you like I said, if you're just requesting like a range request from a car file, then it's super cheap. Like this. Well, that, no, that, that that's, that's two, really cheap. That's two lookups. So that's a range request from a car file means that I already know where it is and what the range is. It's sort of the I give you yeah. a CID, you give me a block. Yeah. If I do if I do that. Are those mm -hmm. is that is that still much cheaper? Um well I, like I mean with a WebSocket request, you have to open the socket, you have to do yeah. all of the compute that it takes with uh in in a worker to do the uh, lib p2p handshakes um it, the significant like difference in like processing it just a regular http request and processing a web socket opening a lib p2p connection and then sending you a block after you've handshaked and sent a want list and <laughs> gone and got it well figured out where it is gone and got it like you remove a whole bunch of stuff by just taking, but doing by just having an HTTP request. Well, you um, still have to do effectively the want list work, right? Because those are just separate HTTP requests. Mm -hmm. But but you, yeah, you still have to. Doing, yeah. you don't have to do web sockets though, right? You can just use no. you know whatever H two no. or H three and and call it a day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. So that that may that may end up helping too as that gets wider support. Yeah, I, I had like a related question because um, uh, you mentioned uh, Dark House currently is listening on uh, WebSockets. Uh, mm -hmm. Would it, it, is there like any caching story there on the edge around when you use this like WebSockets at all? Or do you effectively, really? those are like ephemeral nodes that just got disappearing? No, they're just, well, I don't even know if they're nodes in, in the same way. They're just workers that Cloudflare spin up in a data center to, to deal with the request. And um, the, I don't believe there's any, like, caching. I, I mean, Cloudflare workers, you get the ability to use the, like, Cloudflare's CDN cache. So you can, you, if you want, you could put blocks in in the CDN cache and then read like try the cache before you go and try it from R2. But then um workers have a uh, like a um a sub request limit. So um you like you only get a certain amount like once you've got the request coming into the worker, you only get a certain number of requests you can make to other things to return a response. So if you've got like a big DAG then you're going to want to make like a bunch of requests to R2 to read. Um, R2 is um, Cloudflare's S3 um, to read blocks out of our car files after you've figured out, of course, where they are in the car, which car file they're in and which where it is exactly in the car file. So you can, you can opt to, for every block, ask the cache and potentially miss it and reduce your, potentially reduce your ability to serve stuff by about half or you can just not and uh and just send blocks out uh the sending blocks out is one by one is is true just tricky i mean we do do some clever stuff like um because we can figure out what car a dag is in and we can read the index we can know what blocks are in that car and we can know like if we get a want list with multiple blocks we can go and read like we can do a range request that might include multiple blocks. And so that's one request out that will bring in multiple blocks. So we get to, we get that advantage, but we're still like the amount of data you can serve is, um, is only so much. And that's, well, that's one of the good things about BitSwap and like our IPFS and the P2P is that like, you know, if we run out of requests and like Cloudflare decides to close the lib P2P connection, then IPFS will just, sort of attempt to like find it from somewhere else or reconnect and get it from us, like, you know, use up our, our sub request quota again um, to to use more, um, to, to get the whole DAG. 
and you can start from where you left off because you've obviously got the blocks uh, up until that point. Um, whereas, like if you if you're just making a HTTP request for a big DAG, um, and you you want like a, a car file with all of it in it, then you can't really start again from a particular block unless you're really clever about like what you've received and you're like, okay, well, I've got this part of the sub DAG. Maybe I could ask for multiple cars for, the, <laughs> the, you know, do, do some really clear. I don't know if Lassie does that, um, but that would be interesting. Um, and we probably support that and it'd be fine. Um, but what I'm, what I imagine is what happens is it just, the request just gets retried from the route and then we're, we'll never be able to fulfill it because it's too big. We don't have enough um, budget to make that many requests to R2 to fulfill the response. So that's a big, like, it's a big problem for us right now is like big DAGs. Um, smaller stuff we can do easily, fast, and, um, and without a problem. Uh, bigger stuff is an unsolved <laughs> mystery that we need to figure out somehow. Um, but then th this is this is where the kind of content claims are coming in is that it would like it would be great if people just asked for cars from us or made range requests to that car to like if we pushed what we're doing in the worker to the client then we're done we're done we don't have that problem anymore because the client is now um doing that work and pulling out the bits it needs from from us and like it can get like for a big dag it can be like well give me the content claim for this for this car and it can find out the index it can download the index the index for like a huge dag like 15 gigs is like small it's like 30 meg or something it depends depends i guess uh on the block size. The best things then it's like that if you have like i just want a small snapshot of filecoin state i promise it's no big deal then like the index gets very large yeah yes um, yeah, but like, but then but once you have that index, you can then you know where everything is, and you can just make those requests, and um, you can do really effective batching um, of those ranges. Um, even if you, you even if you don't want the whole DAG, you can still get the chunk you need really easily. Um, and that's sort of the way out of this problem that we have, I guess, is pushing it out from us. Um, I didn't come here to talk about that, but <laughs> here we are. <laughs> I, for that that set of stuff around content claims i i'd recommend if someone wants to come hang out with the content routing working group because it's it's like very similar in nature it's like roughly right the content routing stuff is is trying to just sort mm. of plug the i want x to how do i go get x yeah um problem uh and like yeah how how we want to handle that um so i think like yeah the content claim stuff seems like pretty similar in a lot of ways Guys, i've got to show you this um so i did this the I other would, day i go hang out with uh you know some of you know i guess i, I show up there you know massey torfin uh you know nice some of the 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 probe lab folks uh seems like a, a good place to show up and for anyone else it is also on the luma I've got to show, just got to show you this. I've got a GraphQL interface for con content claims. Uh, you can just give it a, uh, like you can read content claims by content CID, uh, and then you can um, just explore what, hopefully, yeah. Um, so for this piece of content, um, which I believe, or, well, this is, this is, uh, this is risky. Taking yes, a random it is, CID. It is, it is and... a picture of my face. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, everything that goes into web free storage at the moment gets a content claim generated for it, and uh, and you, you can explore um, content claims using this uh, this GraphQL interface and we have different types of claims. So you can see for this particular piece of content that it's got like a part of what we call a partition claim, uh, which means it's in these uh, these parts or these car CIDs. So you can. Uh, go and get that car CID, but it also has like a, what we call a relation claim, which tells you about like the children for the block um, and where where they can be found. And then you can kind of you, what's cool is that you can kind of um, reverse them like the, so the the um, uh, this so this is a partition claim saying that 
this this CRD ha, is in this car, but the claims for this car is that uh, with, there's like an inclusion claim here, and then you can do stuff like on inclusion claim and get um then you can get like the car index. Anyway, I don't want to take up too much time, um, but th th this is uh, kind of cool. I'm going to try and demo this at like um the uh, mother of all demo days uh, soon. But yeah, sneak preview. Yeah, cool. And also like plus one to what I didn't said. There, there's like a overlap of uh, interests and needs uh, between what you're doing and uh, content routing group. And the usual problem is kind of like, how do we find a way to si to like signal those things through other infrastructure, like for example, mm -hmm. around the content uh, routing, like if you have information that those specific blocks or this car is at this url within those byte ranges right and let's say you have a content router and you ask it hey i want the cad it should there should be like standardized way for for that endpoint to return information hey this is available on those peers they may talk bit swap or whatever but then the http story is something that we currently try to figure out we are trying to find the one, find a way to just signal that, hey, this is available on HTTP endpoint that speaks trustless gateway. You can ask it for a block or you can ask it for a car. Um, you know, it could may support those partial cars that we've introduced recently, but in general, how do we signal that? Uh, what you mentioned, the introduction of those, like, hey, there should be a way to go like one step beyond that, to be able to tell, hey, this data that you're looking for, it could be a block or it could be a car describing specific thing. It's on this other URL at those offsets. And that's something that a uh, question mark that we don't currently have a, like it was not discussed you yet. Have a, you have like, a, no, I mean, so we do sort of like, there's a kilobyte of like, I think it's like a kilobyte of like, you know, YOLO space in 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 IPNI for like what you want to put there, right? And mm -hmm. for BitSwap, it's like nothing. I don't know, it could be the protocol version, I guess. Uh graph sync for legacy reasons, they were putting in like DLC like DLC IDs because that's how they used to need to be able to access the data on the server side. Um, but we could put whatever you want in there. I think I, I had a demo in November or something where I shoved in like a manifest that let you, or the CID of a manifest that let you turn like a large SHA-2 block into a bunch of smaller blocks, uh, that you could sort of verifiably fetch, um, which sort of looks like a claim. And so you could decide, like, do I want to throw claims in there in the kilobyte of blah space? Or do I want to have like a, a reference that says, actually, I'm not going to put inside of something like IPNI the, the actual content claim, but I will put a, here's where to get more claims from me. I will put an indirection pointer and send you here. Um, right? Like, I don't know. These are feels like those sorts of things that could be kind of worked out, um, which is why it seems like a good place to to chat yeah yeah i think at the end of the day it always boils down to the fact that you there's no standard syntax for including range request in the url <laughs> so we always need to figure out some sort of like either notation or a, a, a way we pass that metadata um because with the trustless gateway URL, we can like whistle our, ourselves by just going with convention. But if we want to have ability to do the like uh, native HTTP range requests to get a car or a part uh, of our, our blocks, uh, at some point we'll have to figure that out. And I feel uh, content routing group is probably uh, the best place to figure that out because the majority of that will go through big, big or be bigger service providers, and like uh, IPNI group and uh, related APIs. Yeah. Do Do they have a public call like this that I can go on? 
Yeah, it's linked from arrived. the same Luma as this one is. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll go. Okay, I'll check it out. Yeah, IPFS oh. community calendar on Luma .ipf slash IPFS. Mm -hmm. And we got one in five days. Nice, I'm coming. <laughs> yep, I'm going, even. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay. We got like five more minutes, but I, unless you got other topics, which I don't see in agenda, we can <coughs> free up five minutes. I'm done. Thanks for listening to me. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> All Hopefully, you. see you next time. <laughs> yeah, I'll be here. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.